Crystal Beal went to med school at Florida State University and completed the Valley Family Medicine Residency Program, part of the University of Washington. They're a physician owner of QueerDoc.com. Dr. Beal hopes to change the experience of care for the trans and gender diverse community and raise the bar for gender affirming care. Through QueerDoc, Dr. Bill provides increased access to expert, affirming, and culturally competent care for queer and gender expansive children, adolescents, and adults. They currently serve Washington and Alaska through a partnership with Full Spectrum Health and have dreams of expanding service to several more states as an online queer and gender affirming healthcare provider. We talk about why Dr. Bill created their practice, and we talk a little about some of the specific needs of gender diverse people. They make some suggestions about how to best introduce yourself to patients who may be gender diverse. And as it turns out, it really sounds like the best way to introduce yourself to all of your patients. Dr. Bill educates us about issues they have faced when interacting with medical, the medical establishment as a patient and gives some pointers for how we can all interact with gender diverse individuals to make sure the relationship develops as it should, based on trust and free from stigma and biases. We end with some great resources for learning more about the gender diverse community, and a good place to start is QueerDoc.com. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Crystal Beal, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Dr. Block. So you have a very robust website, QueerDoc.com, which shows your, your practice where you treat the trans and gender diverse community. So why did you feel the need to create your practice? Or why did you create the practice? Yeah, well, I was doing locum family medicine at Kaiser Permanente, which used to be group health in Seattle, Washington. And several of our gender care navigators who are just typically people with that MSW helping gender diverse people jump through all the hoops that insurance asks them to jump through to get the care that they need found out I was personally part of the queer community and asked me to start seeing patients. At that point, I had very, very little education around how to medically care for gender diverse people. That being said, it was a need that needed to be filled. So I spent some time doing a lot of CME and and reading, as well as like the Finway webinars and a few other resources within our community, like local providers that I shadowed and, and started taking care of patients there. I just want to unpack that for a second, because yeah. I think I think this is something we sp- spoke about before the show was that you said, don't ask your patient to educate you, right? Do, yes. do, the, do the legwork yourself. And so what you said was being gender diverse yourself, right? You needed to learn about the community and about the medical needs of the community. So, and I think, I am sure there are physicians out there that would assume that just because you are gender diverse yourself, it means that you know everything about the community and the issues that are faced. Yeah, no, there's no one way to be a gender diverse human, just like there's no one way to be any other kind of human. So my personal experience isn't necessarily my patient's experience. Obviously, being part of the community, I did have some, maybe what we would call in medicine, some of the soft skills, like I can walk into a room and not assume someone's gender based on their presentation, not assume someone wants to use their legal name, not assume I can know their pronouns right off the bat. That being said, I had no clue what to do with hormones or anti-androgen therapy or how to kind of meet the needs of the insurance system when it comes to writing referral letters. I think one of the hardest things was like how to order the right syringes and needles for injections. I don't know why that seems impossible sometimes, but it does. It's like the pharmacy gives my clients mismatched pieces that don't fit together. It's, it's great. <laughs> so there was a lot of learning to do. Oh, I can imagine how navigating the insurance situation would be so, I mean, if I have trouble 
getting my patients with asthma the right medicine, I can't <laughs> imagine the the hoops that you have to jump through in order to get your your gender diverse patients the right medications. Yeah, totally. I was fortunate, you know, I work in a community in Seattle where we do have quite a few providers who have been doing this work for, you know, 20 years and they're so generous with their time and their expertise. So I was fortunate enough to get to reach out to them in addition to doing just like formalized CME. And the, then there's some online, the Fenway Institute, which does a ton of LGBTQ free CME video webinars, uh, has a ton of resources that are super helpful as well. Oh, great. Yeah, we're definitely going to cover other, other places are the doctors that are looking to learn more can turn to. But something that you, you mentioned was when you walk into a room, you know how to address the fact that you can't assume someone's pronoun, right? So for the physicians out there who aren't comfortable asking a question like that, what are your what are your recommendations? Yeah, well, one, maybe examine your own bias and like implicit internal experience of that. What is so uncomfortable about asking someone a pronoun? Like, why does that feel challenging as an individual? Just like we would in any other situation, whether it's racism or socioeconomic status issues or substance use disorder issues, kind of looking at our own feelings and trying to pull those out of the exam room. Also, I typically walk in and introduce myself as Dr. Beal, and then I say Dr. Crystal or Crystal is fine. Whatever feels better for you, what would you like me to call you? I think that's a great way to approach it because even non-gender diverse people might not use their legal name as their name of address. And it kind of starts opening the door. And then after we have that part of the conversation, the very next thing I say is, I have no strong preference in pronouns. I use they, them in writing. Um, what pronouns do you use? And some, some providers actually just wear a pen or a button, like a piece of flair on their badge or something like that, that says their pronouns. So people can start, if people want to talk about it. They can see it and open the conversation themselves. I think it, there's kind of a couple different ways to approach it. Flair? Flair. Yeah. <laughs> It just makes me think of office space. Exactly. Yeah. Is, there, is there a minimum amount of flair when, <laughs> when people are working with you that they need to wear in your practice? <laughs> no. Seven. Seven. Seven was the minimum. That's the right. right seven was the minimum. I, that is definitely an office space reference. I'm glad you caught it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you, have, if you have a group of physicians in front of you, because you, you do right now, there are... Believe it or not, there are physicians out there listening to uh, listening to this podcast, and and you want to teach them one or two things that they should know about the the gender diverse community issues that you end up addressing with your physician colleagues over and over. But now you have an opportunity to talk to them and say, so you don't have to keep saying it, the same things over and over. What what are the things that you would like them to know? The top top issues. Yeah, I think the top issues are. Janitors, people are scared coming to the doctor's office. Like there was a huge survey in 2015 of over like 20,000 gender diverse people and up to like a fourth of all gender diverse people delay care because of fear of mistreatment at a provider's office. And so, and up to about half of us have experienced at least like one negative interaction with our provider in the past year. So Anything you can do to make us feel more welcome and safe walking into the room is going to be amazing. And those things include like asking us our name, asking us our pronouns. They mean having multiple boxes and options for gender on the form when we check in at your office. All of those things just set the tone, you know, because if the first thing we do is sit down and fill out a form that just has a male or female gender box. It's like already we don't exist to you, which just makes us not very willing to share who we are or what we need medically. To be fair, though, that issue might be much harder to fix because a lot of the data that we're producing then gets utilized by, say, CMS, right? Like there there are certain minimums that we need to hit on questions that we need to ask. That might be part of the demographic information. So as a provider... I don't have as much control over stuff like that as I need. In fact, 
I don't want you to have to check a lot of the boxes that you need <laughs> right. because it's such a profound waste of your time and it doesn't help me take any better care of you. Right. So I think, yeah. but, but, but to your point, right, the patient maybe has some trouble filling out the paperwork, but if they walk into a, a room and the first thing the physician says is, it's nice to meet you, how would you like me to re- refer to you? Clearly, this physician gets it more so than probably 99% of the, the healthcare workers that this individual has encountered in the past. It's so true. Dr. Black, the, the bar is really low. I would like you to refer to me as Brad. Thank you very much. Sorry, Brad. Brad, <laughs> the bar is really low. Like we've had so many providers like not ask us our name, not ask us our pronoun, much less like discriminate against us, kick us out, refuse us care, misdiagnose us, mistreat our conditions. Like all of those things have happened. If you just start, like you might not know very much, but if you're kind of open to like actually seeing us as humans. And honoring who we are, you're already ahead of most of your colleagues. So be be open and willing to learn. But the other point that you mentioned was don't ask your patients to educate you. Yes. So can you unpack that a little bit? Totally. So I think, you know, typically one of the like really common experiences for gender diverse people, if you get a bunch of us in a room, is that we go to the doctor and the doctor is like a generally nice, kind person who wants to be of service and wants to help, but does not have the education or training. Cause like, right. I think, I don't know when you went to medical school, I had one, one hour lecture on LGBTQ health issues in my entire four years there. And then I had nothing in residency. So even like willing providers might not have the training they need. And so for whatever reason, we sometimes think it's okay to ask patients to teach us what we need to know to take care of them, particularly within the gender diverse community, I would encourage providers to just let patients know that they're willing to learn and that they're going to spend some time educating themselves. And maybe we could reschedule after they've done that versus referring someone out to someone who does know, and then finding those resources that give us basically guidelines and, and protocols to use in treating gender diverse people. So rather than saying, so what medication do you take for, rather than that, say, let me look into this and get back to you, admit to the, you're basically, you're admitting to ignorance, which is being vulnerable, right? A a la Brene Brown, right? It's a good thing. It makes you more relatable, but, but then, but I'm looking to learn. I'm looking to learn. I, you're, you're basically, you're saying, listen, I'm not familiar but you were important enough to me that I'm willing to take the time to figure this out. Right. Which is generally how, like as a, when I was doing traditional primary care, how I approach most things when patients, because you know, patients bring us something they printed off the internet or something they saw on TV. Patients brought things all the time that I knew very, very little about. It was always a pause of, okay, great. I don't, I can't answer these questions right now. Give me a month and I'll write you a long secure message or we'll have a phone visit or I'll see you back in the office. So what are some of the issues aside from the ones that we've touched on, or maybe just go into a deeper dive about the ones that we touched on that you've faced in the the medical community as a, as a patient, as a gender diverse patient? Yeah, I think, you know, primarily I went through five primary care providers before I found someone I felt like, actually didn't judge me just for being who I am. And that was really tough because I started to think, you know, have you ever heard the expression, if you meet three assholes in one day, who is the common denominator? (laughs) Actually, no, I've never heard that before, but that sounds like something, it sounds like something my grandma would say. Yeah. Well, I started to really wonder, like, am I, am I just like a horrible patient? And am I expecting too much? Am I, what's wrong with me? And so much so actually like my fourth primary care provider, I went, my, I actually had my partner who was also a physician come with me to one of my visits. Cause I was like, I just think he's like, I don't, I don't know. It seemed like really weird. And, and so they came with me and they were like, oh no, he's just an asshole. Like, <laughs> like you just need to find a different doctor. And I was like, okay, so it's not, I'm not totally crazy. And I'm not this like horrible demanding patient, but I had, I had a provider in the Southeast who, when I went from being like presenting as this like 
cisgender straight heterosexual person who was married. I actually, I then became divorced and had a, a partner, another partner with ovaries. And this provider misdiagnosed me, treated my condition inappropriately. And then when I called back to say I wasn't getting better, pulled me into his office instead of a patient room and told me he was worried about my choices. And that as like one of his, I was a med student at the time, he said as one of his future colleagues, he felt it was really important to make sure I was like making the right decisions for my life. And I was like, okay, all of that's great, but I didn't get any better with this medicine you gave me. <laughs> that was because it was the wrong, Holy it was the wrong wow. treatment. Never apologized. And his concerns were, so he, it turns out he was a Seventh-day Adventist. And his concerns, ah, I just, I just assumed that there yeah. was religion playing a part in there and they weren't yeah. worried about your sinus infection. They were worried yeah. about your immortal soul. Yes, that is exactly what happened. Okay. Never apologized for missing the diagnosis either. And needless to say, I didn't, I didn't go back until I was one of his students. <laughs> but, but in that physician's eyes, I mean, that's holistic care right there, right? Because right? in, right. in his eyes, he's treating your, well, not treating your medical condition, which is what you were there for, but he's being holistic. He's not, he's just, he's treating your soul too, right? That's, yeah. that's concern yeah. right there. But yeah, yeah I, that's I, exa- exactly what I went there for. Yeah. Check, check your biases at the door. Yeah. So that was fun. I've had, I've had another provider who was like, Oh, this is fine for you now around like my choices in sexual disease testing, but like, you don't want to be doing this when you're 40. And I was like, yeah, I do. Like, (laughs) this is exactly what I want to be doing when I'm 40. Not that (laughs) I'm not 40 yet, but you're obviously sowing some judgments around my decisions that I think are totally like safe and healthy and adult and mature and consensual. So we're not, we're not going to do that either. Wait, wait, I mean, just before you say that, just wait till you get to 40. I'm looking down to the barrel at 40 and I'm just, <laughs> just, just always so tired. <laughs> right. Well, right. That was the thing at the time I was like, Oh, uh, what? 31. And I, I don't know for sure that that's what I want to be doing when I'm 40. But I do know I don't no, like no, no, no. I, I, <laughs> for it when I'm forty. So all right, but, but I mean, so those things, those things seem, those things seem pretty blatant to me. And just the the people that I think listen to my show are people that I would assume do things well, right? They do things well because they're they're somewhat honest with themselves because it's really I, I think completely to be totally honest with yourself, but really good at reflecting on what we're good at, what we're not good at, and trying to improve. So these are people that already ahead, are ahead of the curve because they're trying to do better, right? And, and those people that are, are making those statements to you, I would lump them into the people that like that would say things like, all my patients love me. I do everything great. I don't need to improve at this, right? But you're, you're right now talking to a, a bunch of people who are, who are looking to improve. So they're probably ahead of the curve. So what are the more maybe insidious things that have happened from very well-meaning people that didn't realize that they were maybe alienating their patient? Yeah. Well, I think anytime I get referred to as like, ma'am, miss, lady, like any of those things, like that assign a gender and a gender role to me that I don't truly identify with or feel fits who I am, which happens in conversation and exchange because people have been socialized and trained to do that really can be a moment where I miss a connection with my provider, where the relationship, the potential for the therapeutic relationship to develop is lost. And then I think this doesn't happen as much in in Seattle as it did in the Southeast, but for sure, people assuming that my partners specifically have testicles or assuming that if my partners have testicles, like there's a certain way we have interactions or intimacy or, you know, even worse, asking me if I'm married because until recently I couldn't legally marry most of my partners. So I think those are kind of some insidious things that like can happen around doctor patient interactions that it's, it's really helpful if you change your language to a more open, inclusive and like gender neutral stance. I'm just trying to think how that would, 
how I could apply that in my own practice. You know, I'd, I'm an otolaryngologist, so the gender or sex organs of your partner don't really <laughs> don't really factor into the conversation that that I'm I'm having with right. any of my patients. So just just help me to understand instances in which that becomes relevant even like when when is it that you've encountered aside from just them assuming your pronoun yeah when has has your partner even come up i mean you mentioned earlier right like if you're being test, tested for a sexually transmitted disease fine yeah. but aside from that very specific situation right when is that when does that come up in your interactions yeah well i think a lot of times in in the south it just came up in like the small talk that providers would try to make so Got like it. Okay. You know, like, oh, are you married? Are you having kids? Like, kind of things that aren't applicable in, in kind of my life. And so maybe just asking more open and open-ended questions, or if you're trying to make that connection and start that conversation, letting clients direct that a little more as opposed to a closed-ended assumed question. I would even say asking someone if they have kids is <laughs> Because I've done that and regretted it because it was just <laughs> no, and then there was silence, right? Right. So, so that doesn't sound like I learned very quickly, do not ask that question. If they happen to bring up the fact that they have kids, then definitely ask them about their kids because there's nothing that most parents like to talk about more than their children, right? But right. like, yes, what are you yeah. doing this weekend? It sounds much better for small talk. Do you right. have any coming up what do you like to do for fun right yeah these are, these are um yeah these are all pay these are all questions that can help you learn more about your your patient right and even i do a lot of what i do we do i do check in with patients around social determinants of health so like who shares your household with you as opposed to like just assuming certain people are in that household with them again just leaving that open-ended space for people to answer in a way that maybe you don't personally expect, but like lets them be who they are yeah, safely. Are there any other issues that, that you've encountered that you want to, that you want to touch on? Cause I think that was those, the few that you covered were definitely, they're definitely going to help me in my practice. And I'm sure they're going to help the listeners as well. Let's see. Too open-ended, too open-ended. Okay. Too Sorry. Open-ended. You, you said no, to no, ask. Okay. I, I, would say, <laughs> I would say the major thing is, which may be, your listeners, because they're actively seeking input on how to be better providers, don't need this reminder. But I think a lot of people from any minority, whether it's gender diversity or just being, you know, having a sexual orientation that's in the minority or being of a race that's in a minority, a lot of us can be fairly forgiving if your like intentions are in the right place and you have kindness in your heart when you're talking with us. If you're open and willing to risk, like people just outside of the doctor's office, people refer to me as lady or ma'am all the time. And if you're willing to like allow me the space to correct that and change it without making it about you and getting defensive and shutting down, like I, I can move past it, right? Like there's a whole theory around micro trauma and chronic trauma that we don't have time to go into today that occurs when we do those kinds of things. That being said, as a gender diverse person, I'm willing to work with you if you're just not like a totally, totally closed off person in that area. So normally my episodes, I have to, I click the clean button. Uh-huh. So the, but, but since you said asshole before, now I have to click <laughs> explicit. So we're just going to continue. So don't be an asshole. Don't be a defensive. Like if someone's, if someone's correcting you, right. And, and and listen, we all do this all the time and could benefit from some improvement in that area. Certainly myself, as if someone corrects me, I shouldn't take it personally. It's not, a, it's not a judgment on my character. They're not telling me I'm a terrible person. Just take that as an opportunity to improve. Right, exactly. I think when someone assumes something about my gender and I redirect that to like a more, a more fitting pronoun or reference to me as a person that has nothing to do with them. It is entirely about me and asking them to see me as I am, as opposed to how they assume I should be. So I'm not upset with you or angry with you or mad at you. I recognize that we've all been socialized 
to interact in specific ways. And we're trying to un- undo years and years of social training here. And so I, again, if you can avoid being an asshole and can kind of kind and open-minded, it's such a great starting place at least. And then if going from there, you're willing to do the legwork to educate yourself around some of our healthcare needs and issues, right? Like not assuming what organs we have based on the way we look, right? I can't tell you how many case studies I've had of people who didn't feel comfortable coming out to their primary care doctors as transgendered after they had already transitioned pretty significantly. And so I'm um, like, we're like, maybe they have facial hair, but we're born with a cervix. So weren't getting cervical cancer screening and had advanced advanced stage like cervical cancers things like that so like we if you create a space that feels safe for us by like doing these small things with like more inclusive gender neutral language you're more likely to have patients be honest and then you can kind of explore those healthcare needs together right or you know i've also uh, we also had a similar case with a trans feminine person who was not getting any kind of screening for prostate cancer who ended up with like fairly advanced metastatic prostate cancer as well. And I think it all starts with that introduction. Hi, I'm Dr. Brad Block. You can call me Dr. Block. You can call me Brad. You can call me Dr. Brad. How would you like me to refer to you? Right. And that, and that way that can work on so many levels, right? I, I mean, I don't know how many of my patients are, are gender diverse. We, because this is just not something that I treat. And <laughs> doesn't ear, nose, and throat doctor, right? Unless, yeah. unless the uh, changing like someone's larynx is is part of their their transition, it, it's not really something that that I treat. I mean, those are just not issues, right? Like sinus infections is, is a sinus infection, and, and hearing loss and earwax, right? But still, right? That's that. This works for because I was thinking about behind before the episode, right? Like if I have patients that 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 are binary, right? I'm going to just assume, but how do I know which patients should I be asking? How would you like me to refer to you? And the, the answer is all of them. Because some patients, because I, and that's, that's a problem that I've encountered. I have some patients that I'm very familiar with because I've been seeing them for years. And like, I, I'm totally fine with them calling me Brad and I can call them by their first name because I mean, I, you know, I might take care of their kids and their parents and like, you know, and we're, we're, right. And I want to make them comfortable feeling that way. And so it takes all the, you know, all the question out of that, uh, you know, it's in, in a, sto- a story from, from my family which has nothing to do with be, being gender diverse, but I'm just going to take the opportunity to talk about myself, right? We had talked Go about that beforehand. Was my my mom's mom said to my dad when they were first married, "Call me mom," and he said, "I can't. I have a mom." So then, when he was telling me that story, he I said, "Well, then, what did you call her?" He said, <laughs> "Nothing. I just waited until she looked at me." <laughs> Like, and they were married for like 35 years before she passed away. So that's 35 oh, years. Gosh. Like an ambiguous title. Like don't, don't, right. don't and give your patients the opportunity to be more comfortable with you. And right. I think it's like in, in all in all situations, irrespective of whether they're binary or gender diverse. I totally agree. I think, you know, I heard somewhere in my medical training that patients perceive the doctor patient relationship as more therapeutic when we introduce ourselves as doctors first, which is great. We also never know who has been traumatized by doctors in the past. Unfortunately, it it does happen. I, most of your listeners are going to be like lovely people, but occasionally there are doctors who more than just like negligence or discrimination, but actually assault and abuse patients. And so we never know when we're talking to someone who's had that experience. So giving them the opportunity to choose how they address me and potentially avoid a very traumatic and triggering word is, I think, important. And unfortunately, trauma is more common among gender diverse people than their cisgender counterparts. Um, I think offering that even before we like check in about their name is a great starting place as well. How would you lead into that? You know, I don't, I don't say that like, that whole long spiel. I just, I just offer to let them call me Dr. Beal, Dr. Crystal or Crystal, whatever. Feels oh, like. I misunderstood. I thought you meant like if they've had a past trauma, like op- opening yeah. up with, with that, like asking that question at the beginning of the visit. 
No, I don't. I definitely don't talk about that at the beginning of a visit. I, again, I think the, these little steps of like, how do, how do you want me to call you and what pronouns you use start this uh, safe space. Yeah. Hey, the, that that the eventually they right. may be able to open up about a trauma like that. I do might not be relevant to all of your patients, but I do anytime I'm referring gender diverse people out, I'm trying to refer them to providers I know have experience and cultural competency in working with gender diverse people. But, you know, if I know I'm referring them out for something that has the potential to be traumatizing, like I'm referring a trans man out for a pelvic procedure or something like that, we do totally talk about trauma. Then we talk about past trauma, potential future trauma, and how we can minimize that up to including offering like a lorazepam for the visit or something like that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's the thing, right? Like a lot of primary care providers who maybe maybe have done some like reading on UCSF and watched a few of the webinars and are super excited to be offering hormones and like meeting some of their patients needs. That's really amazing and awesome, but they might not have the skill when it comes to doing a pelvic exam on a trans, a trans person. But again, it, it doesn't just apply to trans people. Like we never know when the person we're doing a pelvic exam on has had previous trauma. So I think it's always worth asking that question. And then maybe talking to a provider who's done a few public exams on people like that to get like tips and tricks and skills and how we approach that. Cause a lot of times I'm using different instrumentation on people who have been on testosterone therapy for a while than I, I am on people who haven't. So if our, our listeners are looking to learn more about the gender diverse community, what are some resources that you would recommend? Yeah, I would say for providers, UCSF has an amazing, the university of California at San Francisco has a Center for Excellence in Transgender Health, and they have amazing kind of guideline, basic textbook that's all available online for free. Their primary care protocols that gives you like a, a basic introduction to gender diversity. It's going to go through like the alphabet soup and language, you know, like what the L is, what the G is, what the T is, what the Q is, and define non-binary, gender queer, gender diversity, transgender, all of those things. So that's really helpful. But then it's also going to give you preventative care guidelines. So like recommendations for preventative care and screening, just going to give a recommended protocol for transition related hormonal support. And then it's also going to give you like common complications or issues that pop up within that community on, on treatment for that, which is really fabulous. The Endocrine Society and WPATH, the World Professional Association on Transgender Health, both both also have guidelines and protocols. The WPATH text is a little bit more dense than the UCSF. It's really worth reading, but it can, can be a little harder to get through as a busy person in practice. And then the Endocrine Society guidelines, I think, are a little more restrictive than maybe the other two. And so those are kind of great starting points. The Fenway Institute does free webinars, which are also fabulous. You can sit down for an hour watch it, do the little quiz at the end and get, you know, an hour's worth of category one CME for free, which is always, I think, fairly motivational for me as a provider trying to maintain my board. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then going, going to CME is great. I've been to several great ones on the West Coast as far as gender odyssey and gender diversity. Some of my local institutions do kind of an annual LGBTQ situation as well. Reaching out to providers who do this work and asking for like more local support in your area is great. There's another provider doing something because I do most of my work through telemedicine and there's another provider in the Southeast doing something kind of similar at queermed.com. And then I'm also part of the consult group. So uh, through one of our local nonprofits that supports gender diverse people, they organized kind of like a listserv of a whole bunch of different providers from all different modalities of care who care for gender diverse people. And so whenever you run into an issue, you don't know how to handle like There's like an immediate email consult right there, which is a super valuable resource to have. So that segues well into where can people find you online? <laughs> yeah, queerdoc.com. And my email is queerdoc at queerdoc.com. And I also have a uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram that I'm not as great 
uh, responding to messages on, but uh, usually within like a couple of days, get to them. And your your Twitter handle is dot queer at, doctor. at, at, at dot queer. queer. Not yeah. queer doc because that's someone else probably. That yeah, there was a documentary movie called Queer Doc. Oh. <laughs> I took it from. But on you. Facebook and Instagram, it's Queer Doc. Queer Doc. Okay, great. And just take a moment to tell us about what your website is all about. Yeah, well, so it is like the launching path for my private practice, which I do do telemedicine-based queer-focused care, queer and gender-affirming medicine. Uh, So basically, people can do just video visits with me to do things like PrEP, contraception, STD testing, and gender-affirming care, like hormones for transition and referrals for surgery for gender-affirming procedures. And then I also kind of try to basically compile all of the resources that I had into one place in part to in a totally self-serving way, right? Because I think doing primary care and being a physician, so much of it was about being able to like point people in the right direction for information that they wanted, right? So like kind of pre-vet resources for them. So they weren't just Googling things and finding a shady answer. So in part, it was a place for me to kind of dump all the things that I had been using and then just make them available to my community. And so there are resources around gender expression, around changing your gender identity markers on legal documents. Um, there's, I also practice in Alaska. I'm partnered with another clinic up there called Full Spectrum. So there's resources in, in Washington and Alaska for like queer-friendly mental health providers or speech pathologists or hair removal things like that. So I tried to make it a pretty accessible resource for people who needed things and information around those things. There's also a ton of information on hormone therapy. There's videos on self-injections. There's videos to watch on feminizing therapies, on masculinizing therapies. There's giant seven-page documents about everything you wanted to know about testosterone therapy or everything you wanted to know about estrogen therapy. And there's a physician resource page where they can find kind of all the things I've mentioned already for self-education. And then they can reach me too. I'm always open to helping point people in the right direction if they have questions or having trouble with any kind of care. Well, you, you, you threw your, L, your um, email out there for potential patients and uh, yeah. <laughs> that's very, very brave of you to do. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a business email, so... <laughs> I mean, I am the one checking it. It's just yeah. me, but it's on the website and on the Facebook anyways. So Good point. I guess, I guess you found me because I put my podcast related email address out there as well. So that's, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So Dr. Crystal Beal, this has been extremely informative and I think we all have a lot to think about. We all have a lot to work on and I will definitely be at the very least, introducing myself to every single patient in a very different way than I've done it in the past. And I think even something that small is going gonna, is gonna to help me connect with my patients all the better. So really, I appreciate you taking all this time out of your Saturday afternoon to talk to us and educate us. Thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate you taking time and being interested in learning. Not everyone is, so thank you. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.